couple things I need to tell you before we get into the word. First of all, my name's not Kirk. All right? I, I, know, I know some of you were, had your hearts expecting. Now you have to deal with disappointment. I feel your pain. All right, second disappointment I'm going to give you today. Are you, are you, I know you can't handle all this disappointment. Second disappointing thing. I don't have a Christmas message for you. Ever, not one, two, three. Oh. I, I was asked to take this spot a couple months ago, and uh, to be quite honest, I wasn't thinking Christmas. I, I'm just going to give you what the Lord gave me. So, uh, again, you have, you have my sincere apology. But I, I think somehow we're going to muddle through this. Um, I, I just want to read the words to this uh, Revelation song here. Um, it says, clothed in uh, rainbows of living color, Flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory, and power be to you, the only wise king. You know, it, it, it struck me when we, uh, every time we sing this song, I think about those words and that our hope when we sing these words is my wife Kathy's reality. You ever think about that? So she's experiencing what we're singing in hope that we're going to see someday. And uh, I don't know if I've ever been this close to heaven before. Does that sound kind of weird to you? Uh, you know, it, it's like there's a, there, there's a part of me that's seeing that as a reality. And, uh, you, know, you know, that said, um, those of you who may not know, my, uh, my wife Kathy passed away in uh, March. And um, I want all of you guys to know, that knew her understand a little something. It's okay for you to talk about her. It's okay. We, I talk about her all the time. And it's okay. We like to talk. My, my family and me, we like to talk about Kathy. And don't feel like you're going to upset us if you bring her up. We like to remember her. And you know what would, would really upset us is if somehow she got forgotten. So we like, we like talking about her. So it's okay, really. It's really okay. And I'm not going to charge you for that. <laughs> that one's free. Okay. But folks, now the meter is running. So let's bring it on. All right. Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 32. We are going to read together, well, I'm going to read, you can follow along if you will, uh, perhaps one of the weirdest passages of the Bible, a man actually wrestles with God. And uh, so we're going to be talking about that. The man is uh, Jacob, and uh, well, you already know God, right? Okay, so well, I, I hope some of you do anyway. And uh, they have this wrestling match that goes... All night long. Anyone here ever wrestle? Some of us have wrestled. <laughs> uh, I remember uh, back in high school gym class, our, uh, our, our, our coach had this really neat idea. He was going to teach us how to wrestle with a volleyball. And so the deal was, you get this volleyball, and two guys, and both guys grip the volleyball, Right? And the, the object of the wrestling match is you got to do whatever you can to get that volleyball away from the other guy. So the coach picks the two skinniest, scrawniest guys to do the wrestling match. And of course, I was one of them. <laughs> of course, I have now become a full gospel preacher. And uh, I'm not so skinny anymore. But anyway... Uh, but there's a lot of different types of wrestling. Um, I, I, I was at a, a pig wrestling match one time. That was a hoot. Four guys and a pig, and the pig won. And then, get this, part two was four ladies and a pig. And that pig lost. <laughs> Let that be a lesson, men. So there's professional wrestling, there's sumo wrestling. Ever see sumo wrestling? 
these two heavy set guys go at it in diapers, and they try to push each other out. I mean, I don't know what the rules are. Uh, Indian wrestling, you guys know, know this deal. Well, um, here we got a story about uh, Jacob. He's one of the patriarchs. Uh, what is a patriarch? Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the patriarchs. Uh, they're the uh, founders of uh, the Jewish faith, and which uh, later on became uh, known as the Christian faith. He uh, preceded Christmas. Jacob came before Christmas. He actually preceded the book of Numbers. We've been in the book of Numbers lately, and uh, he preceded the book of Numbers, I think, by about 400 years. Uh, he wrestles with the, uh, the, the verse here says uh, it's a man that he believes is God, and we're, we're going to be talking about that in a little bit. And um, I don't know what kind of wrestling match it was, but we're going to dig into that. So let's get into the word. Uh, verse 24 goes like this, and Jacob was left alone. Okay, so let, let me give you a little background. Jacob left home 20 years ago. And he left with nothing, and he goes off, and he, uh, he hangs out with his uncle Laban, marries two of his daughters. That's uh, another story. <laughs> and anyway, and then proceeds to become very wealthy. And the Lord speaks to him and tells him, you need to go back to the promised land. You, go, you need to go back home. So uh, he doesn't tell his uncle. He just splits on him, and uh, he heads home. And uh, his uncle chases after him, but the Lord speaks to his uncle and says, hey, you better not say anything good or bad to Jacob. So his, his, his uncle basically lets him go, but they make a deal. He ain't going back to his uncles. He can only go forward. So he's going forward, and he's wondering now, he's wondering how Esau's doing, his brother, because he stole his brother's birthright. And uh, he didn't leave on too good of terms with Esau. So he's, uh, he's heading home, and he's a little nervous because some of his servants report back that Esau and 400 of his best friends are coming to meet him. <laughs> so it says in uh, verse 24, And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when the man saw that he could not prevail against Joseph, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask me my name? And there he blessed him. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Let's pray. Father God, as we uh, enter into this passage, Lord, I just pray that you would allow us to understand from your Holy Spirit what we should take away from this passage. Lord God, challenge us, uh, help us to grow closer to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My question for you today. We're not there yet, brother. <laughs> but we're almost there. All right. My question for you today is, have you ever wrestled with God? Some people have, some people haven't. Have you ever wrestled with God? I think there are three types of people here today. Those who aren't even sure God exists. Don't really know what to think. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but somehow you wound your way here. Praise God. I'm glad you're here. Let's, uh, let's see what you can figure out by the end of this sermon. Uh, then the second category is uh, those of you who, who maybe have gone through a pain or struggle. Something that uh, Henry Blackaby would call a crisis of faith. Something has happened in your life and you're saying, wow, I don't know what to do with that. And somehow God's involved and you're not sure which way you're going to go. Maybe you're gonna, your faith in God's going to grow stronger. Maybe, maybe you're going to chuck it all. You're at a crossroad, if you will. 
And the third group is those of you who are content with your relationship with God where it's at. You feel good. You're content, everything's fine, and you don't realize that you are about to enter into a wrestling match with God. God bless you. Hang on to your seats. It's going to be a wild, wild ride. All right, so let's dig into this passage and see what the Lord has for us. Let's take this apart. Okay, so Jacob is alone and afraid. Have you ever been alone and afraid? Have you ever been alone and afraid? Like I said, God has directed Jacob home after 20 years. Genesis 31, verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred. And these are very important words. I will be with you. I will be with you. And let me, let me submit this to you. I, I don't know if you're going to receive this. I don't know if you're going to accept this. But I want to submit this to you. You're never, ever really alone. You're never really alone. Jacob may have felt to be alone, but he wasn't alone because God had already told him, I will be with you. And he was with him. a matter of fact, he'd been with him for a long time. God had continued to bless him. He left the promised land with nothing more than a staff in his hand. And he went to this place that he later called Bethel. And he had this incredible vision of these angels going up and down like an escalator to heaven. And it was just this incredible vision. He says, wow. He, he, he's like, this, in, in today's language, he said, I've reached the porthole. <laughs> and I, th there's heaven on the other side. And, and so he's like, this is a special place. Cause, so he called it Bethel. And uh, then he made his way to uh, Laban's area with nothing. And like I said earlier, he, uh, he managed uh, to marry two sisters, which uh, from Scripture, I would not recommend doing. <laughs> All right, just... Just, just to let you know. But anyway, now he's returning, and he's got these two wives, and he has two concubines, and you can Google that and figure out what that's all about. Eleven kids, you know, all those wives and concubines, what else can you think about? All right. Uh, not to mention servants. He has sheep, goats, camels, cows, bulls, donkeys, etc. In short, he's rich. God has blessed him materially. He's got a lot of stuff. And as a result, he also has a lot to lose. So his uncle Laban follows him because he kind of snuck out. How do you sneak out with all that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe he waited for Laban to have a big party and maybe too much to drink or something. I don't know. But he uh, deceived his uncle. He can't go back, back uh, to uh, Laban. And uh, he had just heard that Esau's coming with those 400 guys. Let's just say small army. So he's between a rock and a hard place. And he's afraid. But he's trying to follow God. And that's something we can take to the bank. He is trying to put God in his life. And he's, he's like all of us. All of us are on a journey. We're all in different areas of our journey, right? We can, we can accept that. Some people are further along than others. We're all on a journey. We're all, we're all here and we're all on a journey. And Jacob's on his journey and he's trying to follow God in some way, in a way he can understand. And God has begun to speak to him. And that's kind of an exciting thing when God speaks to you. And for whatever reason, he recognizes that God has taken a special interest in him. But he's not sure he can trust God. Maybe you're not sure you can trust God. I don't know where your, your journey is at. But God has blessed him and made him rich. So Jacob devises a plan. And if you listen to any of the words we had earlier, you'll know that this is probably not the way you want to go. Okay? Because what we need to do is we need to fully rely on God. We need to put all our trust in God. And that's not what Jacob's doing. He is afraid. So it says in uh, verses uh, 7 and 8, of uh, Genesis 32, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left can escape. All right? He's, he's scheming. He's devising a plan. He's trying to work it out on the best of his ability. And the best of his ability is that half of us are going to get wiped out. Doesn't sound like very good odds to me, 
But again, he's on a journey. He hasn't gotten to the point yet where he fully relies on God. So he splits the company into two groups, and then he decides to try something that most of us do when it's, you know, the last thing we're going to do. So he prays. That was kind of tongue-in-cheek, all right? That should be the first thing we do. But anyway, he prays. And he says, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, now listen to these words. He's kind of turning it back on God. Return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. All right, so he's blaming it on God. I'm in this predicament because of you, Lord. You've got to read between the lines here. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness you have shown me, you have shown to your servant. True, for I have, for only with my staff I crossed this Jordan and now have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he's reminding God of all God's promises to him, which is not a bad thing. It's not bad to remind God. But he still isn't fully trusting in God because you see the very next thing he does is he sends Esau a gift. So he sends Esau a gift, which constitutes a bribe, really. So he sends him these 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milking camels. Milking camels? Ever try camel milk in your coffee? All right, whatever. And their calves, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys. Then he goes off by himself. And like I said before, he's not really alone. And he has a wrestling match with God. Have you ever wrestled with God? Have you ever had a struggle with God where you're like, God, I don't understand this, and this thing's going on, and I need some answers, and you're not speaking to me, or whatever. Circumstances have gone a certain way, and you, should, should, you thought it should have gone a different way. And you're like, God, I thought you were going to bless me, and now this is going on. What's up? So Jacob wrestles with God, but it's not a metaphorical wrestle. It's a real wrestle. One of the weirdest things I've ever read in the Bible. He has a wrestling match with God. Now, I know the passage says it was a man, but there's three reasons I believe it was, it was God. First of all, Jacob recognized it was God, because at the end of it, he says, this place is Peniel, which means the face of God. He came face to face with God. That's what he believed. The second thing is when, he's, when his wrestling partner uh, when he asks his wrestling partner, what's your name? His wrestler partner's like, why do you ask me my name? As in, who do you think I am? Don't you know me? And then finally, it's not the first time God has shown up in human form. He, he actually uh, went to uh, see uh, Abraham one time when there were, uh, this whole issue of Sodom and Gomorrah came up. And if you want, you can read your Bible on that. I'm not going to go into that now. But... Jacob's not the only one that's wrestled with God, right? I think, I think we've got a room full of people that have wrestled with God. My third question for you for today is, do you think God fights fair? <laughs> Does God fight fair? When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint, and he wrestled with him. Does God fight fair? Think about that. Let me get back to that story with the, uh, the volleyball. All right. So two scrawny kids and a, one volleyball in front of the whole class. Actually, it's two classes of, of boys because they combine the classes because, they, they, you know, the gym is kind of a big area. And both of us got a hold on this volleyball, right? And as soon as, he, as soon as the coach says, you, you, you guys got a, big, a, a good grip, the other kid whips it around, and I still got it. And I'm like, you know, I ain't letting go because all my friends are watching. All my peers are watching. And so, you know, the coach settles us down and says, okay, you both got a good grip. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got a good grip. The other kid says, yeah, I got a good grip. And then he blows the whistle. 
and we are just writhing and pulling, and we're on the floor, and we're tumbling around. And I'm like, I am, you know, I know one thing. I am not letting go of this ball. I am not letting go of this ball. And I'm sure the other kid's saying the same thing. But it's becoming clear to me that this kid ain't going to let go any more than I'm going to let go. And we're writhing around on the ground, and I, I, I knew there's, there's only one way I'm going to be able to get this ball away from this kid. So I wrap my legs around the kid's waist, and I put a scissor grip on him, and I squeeze with all my might. I just squeeze with all my might. And boop. I got the ball. All right, did I cheat? Did I? You guys were just laughing and agreeing with me a moment ago. There weren't any rules that said I couldn't squeeze the living daylights out of the guy. You know, the fact of the matter is God didn't cheat because God plays by his rules, not our rules. And, you know, there's a lot of people that say, you know, they have something against God because God, you know, God doesn't logically do things like we think he should do. If God were God, why are there starving people in the world? If God were God, why are there, there, there persecutions? Why are Christian martyrs even happening? If God were God, why is there starvation? Why is there famine? Why is there this? Why is there that? If God were God, if God were God, if God were God. Well, you know what? God doesn't play by your rules. He don't. He's got his own set of rules that he plays by. And when we wrestle with God, we got to realize it's his rules. It's his rules that we're wrestling by. Now that said, does God play by his own rules? And by golly, he does. Because we're, we're celebrating Christmas. This is the Christmas part of the message, so you can feel good about this. <laughs> so 2,000 years ago, he took on human flesh. He could have come as a man, but he didn't. He came as a baby. So he could experience everything we experience. Diaper rash, he had it. I don't know, maybe. But I mean, you get the picture. You know, nights of being cold, hungry, wet, uh, crying at night. Uh, going through that whole motion, having to submit themselves to somebody else's care. He did that because he was on a mission. And his mission was to redeem you and me. And he was willing to put it all on the line and come and play by his own rules, the rules that we have to live by, he lived by, so that he could redeem you and me. And, you know, some, some wise people, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I work by a... I work with a lot of college professors that are wise in their own eyes. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and, you know, people will say things like, can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it up? I mean, you know, it's kind of like these, these kind of things. And my answer is, he did. He made the human heart. He made a human heart that could reject him. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, Mr. <laughs> PhD. Yeah. But Jacob, even though his hip is knocked out, is not letting go. <laughs> he is not letting go until this guy blesses him. And in, in the Bible, we understand that it's always the greater blesses the weaker, right? The greater blesses the weaker. So, it, so if anything, he's understanding that this guy, God or not, whatever your, your own personal theology is, is, is coming up with, this guy could bless him, and he wants that blessing. So he keeps a hold of the guy tight until the guy agrees to bless him. And then the man asks Jacob a very interesting question. What's your name? Now, does God know our name? Of course he does. So what's he really asking? You know, it's kind of interesting. In the Bible, the name of a person reflects his character. So what kind of name is Jacob? Jacob means deceiver. Literally, it means heel. It means somebody who grabs somebody by the heel, which metaphorically means he's a deceiver. So when people said, hi, Jacob, what they're saying is, hi, deceiver. Make sure I got my wallet in my pocket. All right? So when deceiver speaks, what is everybody thinking? Wonder what he's up to. Is he a con man? 
He's going to try to take some money of me or something. He's going to get some sheep off of me. Maybe that's what they're worried about then. I don't know. So what's in a name? In the past, people called him Jacob the Schemer. But now, he's going to get a different name. He's going to get the name Israel. Now, Israel is one of those interesting Hebrew concoctions because it's like three different words are coming together. And it, the way it's arranged, it could mean uh, one who, who, um, who wrestles with God, or it could also just mean a prince of God. So depending on your, how your translation is, is getting it, but I like the idea of him being called a prince of God. Because he's not number one. A prince is not number one, right? There's a king. There's a king. But the prince is near and dear to the heart of God, right? The prince is close to God. And the fact of the matter is, God had his hand on Israel. God had his hand on Jacob. God was keeping him safe. A matter of fact, it goes on, if, if you read on in uh, Genesis, Genesis 35 verse 5, uh, talks about the, uh, Jacob and his sons journeying. And it says, as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them, so did they, not, they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Now here's an interesting thing. You've got to get a picture of this. People in those days lived in walled cities for a reason. There are raiders and marauders riding on camels and horses and stuff that would go and attack groups. You know, if there's a caravan, uh, chances are there's gold or spices or something of value. We're going to attack this caravan and steal what we can steal. Well, when Jacob is coming back in the promised land, there's this huge caravan. Think of all the sheep, the goats, the camels, uh, the, the, uh, the donkeys. Uh, you know, two wives and two concubines, all those children. Think of all that stuff. This big caravan of people are, are coming, on, coming, to, coming to the scene. It'd be an easy thing to take a, get a bunch of, get together with 400 of your best friends. Hey, let's go and let's plunder this group. Let's take what we can out of them. That wasn't happening because God put a terror around them so, so that they were protected. So when, that, when this big group came upon a city, the people of that city are like, we ain't touching those people. We ain't going anywhere near them. God has had his protection. So there was really never any question, at least in God's eyes, that Jacob was safe and his family was going to be safe. He was safe from Laban. He was safe from Esau. He was safe from the surrounding people. For when it really came down to it, Jacob had no real reason to fear. He just needed to trust in God. So who are you? I don't know if you noticed, but some of the underneath the names. <laughs> <laughs> underneath the names, I was putting a little bit, because, you know, in English, in English, <laughs> our names really don't reflect who we are, do they? Huh? Yeah, one cool dude. There we go. <laughs> My name means small. <laughs> but you know what? When I get to heaven, I'm going to get a new name. That only God knows. He's going to give me that new name. And it's going to really reflect my character. Right? And the same thing with every one of you. God's going to give you a new name. So who are you? Genesis 32 verse 29 says this. And Jacob asked him, the guy he's wrestling with, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. You know, identity is kind of a big thing. We all have, you know, we all have really multiple identities. You know, I was listening to them up there, you know. Okay, so, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm an elder here. I'm a director there. I'm a father there. I'm a, I'm a grandfather. I mean, I'm a lot of things to a lot of different people. Some people call me friend. Ted does. Ted, you're my friend. <laughs> yeah, I love you, man. You know, one time when Jesus, when Jesus was walking the earth, the uh, people came up to him and called him good teacher. And he said to them, why do you call me good? 
There's no one good except God alone. Now, was Jesus saying he wasn't God? No. He was asking the person, who do you think I am? Why do you call me good? Because if I'm just a good teacher, that means I could give you advice, and it's like, I ain't going to follow that advice. But if I'm God in the flesh, by golly, you better listen to what I say. Amen? One time I was in Guatemala, and uh, we were in this remote area, and uh, this uh, little girl was kind of following us around, and um, yeah, it's kind of, I, I didn't put my contacts in because I was worried about, you know, germs and stuff, so I was just wearing glasses. And this little girl was running around watching me, and she kept calling me uh, Cuatro Ojos, Cuatro Ojos, Cuatro Ojos, means four eyes. <laughs> so after a while, I got a little annoying. So I said, Pastora. And she shut up. Because <laughs> they know what a pastor is. And you don't call a pastor a cuatro ojos. <laughs> you know, ultimately it comes down to that. Do we know who we're dealing with? Do we know who we're dealing with? Do we know who we're dealing with with God? Um, I don't know if you've noticed or not, I'm quite taken with my grandchildren. All right, you noticed. All right, so uh, when Jackson was little, <laughs> yeah, he's still little, but he's, when he was smaller, you know, I, I, I'd take, when he came to visit, I'd put him in my truck. And, oh, he thought he was such a big cheese. He's the steering wheel, and, and he, I'm letting him flip every button and every switch. The truck's not running. He, he's not going to do anything. Although he did learn which key was the truck key, and, and he, could, he could turn it not to start it, but he could turn it. <laughs> But anyway, he'd be playing, he'd be pulling the visor down, messing with the, uh, the mirror. I didn't care. But I was letting him do all the things his parents didn't let him do. <laughs> and we're having a good old time. So one time he's at my house, and he's kind of messing in the kitchen, and he goes up to my dishwasher, and he turns the knob. Now, the dishwasher was set to go. He turned the knob, it turned on. I didn't like that. I said, no, no, don't touch, don't touch the knob. So he's like, <laughs> so I took his little hand, and I smacked it. It was the first time I had ever disciplined him. And you could see in his face this horror. <laughs> and then the howling started, not crying. Howling. His world was shattered. Oh my goodness. This guy that is so much fun can also smack my hand. What a revelation. And you know, sometimes we get that revelation about God. We get that revelation from God that, you know, there is a blessing side to this whole deal. But also, there's an obedience side. And God means business. Amen? So how often do we realize who we're dealing with in God? You know, sometimes we go through life and we receive what I would call maybe a fresh revelation from God, but it, it may shake us up. It may shatter what we used to think. Uh, like I said, Henry Blackaby calls it a crisis of faith. Um, sometimes it just plain hurts. And you're like, wow, I didn't know God would do that. But God does that to get our attention. And Jacob, like all of us, you know, he was on a spiritual journey. He's learning about God. Did Jacob get what he asked for? Really what he asked for was safety. He had it all the time. But that wasn't the issue that God wanted to deal with him. God wanted to deal with Jacob's character. And that's why that wrestling match took place. It was really Jacob's character that needed fixed. Jacob just wanted a blessing. He just wanted protection. He just wanted safety. But God wanted to take it one step further. You know, they say, be careful what you pray for, because you might get it. <laughs> but sometimes 
you pray for something and God says, I'm going to give you what you want, but there's a whole lot more involved. Are you done wrestling yet? <laughs> so Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to, to, face to face, yet my life has been delivered. It's kind of interesting. In the Jewish mindset, if they looked upon the face of God, it meant death. And that's probably why the man wrestling him wanted to leave before it became dawn, because, hey, the light, if the light goes on, you'll see my face. So out of deference to him, he's like, i got to get out of here before the dawn comes because I really believe it was God himself. But Jacob, now Israel, wants to know him better. He's starting to realize he needs to know this God he's serving better. And people, this is a good place to be. Know God better. Sometimes he takes us through these wrestling matches so that we can know him better. And you know what? Frankly, if you don't initiate it, he will. He will. Let, let me uh, tread carefully here. Look, I've been saved about 30 years. I've been walking with God for about 30 years. I have seen a lot of stuff. I've experienced a lot of stuff. And, you know, I don't mean that to say that prideful. It's just it is what it is. And uh, I, I deal with a lot of people in, uh, like, entry-level positions with God. I mean, they just are just getting to know God, and they're asking me stuff. And, and, it's, and it's like, there is so much I want to say to them. There is so much I want to reveal to them. There, and, and it's like, but it's too much. It's just too much. And I'm afraid if I tell them too much, I'm going to scare them away. You know what I'm saying? But how much more with Jesus would he walk the earth? Could you imagine him having come out of heaven to earth, who's walking along, talks to this guy named Nathaniel, and he says, yeah, Nathaniel, I saw you when you were sitting under the tree. And Nathaniel's like, wow. Wow, that's, that's amazing. And, 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 and he's like, I just can't believe it. And, and Jesus says to them, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You'll see greater things than these. And he said to them, said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's kind of like what J Jacob saw, right? And it's not talking literally, it's metaphorically. This, this, this revelation from God out of heaven coming down and, and Jesus giving it to them. In short, he says to, Jesus says to Nathaniel, you ain't seen nothing yet. Hang on to your hat, dude. You ain't seen nothing yet. And so I say the same to you and me. Folks, we ain't seen nothing yet. But are you ready to go deeper? Are you ready to go deeper in God? Maybe you're afraid. I don't want any weird experiences. <laughs> I'm the king of weird. <laughs> if, you got, if you want to hear about weird experiences, I, I, I'll make your hair stand on end. All right? But the fact of the matter is, the only reason Jacob had a weird experience is because he wasn't fully relying on God. So God had to wrestle with him. Hey, let me, let me, let me cut to the chase. You don't want weird experiences? Just fully rely on God. And it'll be simple. You give God a little bit of trouble, he'll give you trouble back. Amen? So fully rely on him. You know, when, when Jacob was told that Esau and 400 men were coming, he panicked. But if he had been fully relying on God, he'd said, oh, 400 men, wow. We better kill some sheep and have a feast. Those guys will be hungry when they get here. Right? Fully rely on God. You know, think about it. I'm, I'm not trying to be weird. I'm just saying, you know, day-to-day -day life. What do we worry about? Stuck behind a traffic light. You curse under your breath. Huh. Going to be late. Maybe God wants you late. So what? You've got bigger fish to fry. You're worried about political candidates? So what? 
God can handle that. You're worried about people in authority? Give it to God. Pray about it. So what? You got bigger fish to fry, people. Last week, I don't know how, how much you guys pay attention to the prophetic words or not. I, I, I try to write them down when I can. This little lady came up to prophesy to Doris Mitchell. Some of you know her, some of you don't. You probably just know her as that little lady. You know, I, I said I got about 30 years in walking with the Lord. She's probably got 50 or maybe even 60. So you can un understand how hard it is for her to unpack the revelation she's getting from God. And she came up last week... And she's talking about something so simple, but so complex, I guess. And it's that this is not our home. This is not our home. So people, just relax. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Don't sweat the small stuff. So what? The traffic light turned red. Don't sweat it. It'll be okay. God desires a relationship with you. So go deeper. He stands at the door and knocks. That's all. He's talking, when it says in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock, he's talking to Christians there. He wants to sup with us, like have supper, like have fellowship, like enjoy a relationship. That's what God wants out of us. He wants to have a relationship with us. So it's time to quit fighting God and just enter into that relationship. Is there a cost? Yeah, Jacob left limping. It's only because he was fighting God. It would have been a lot easier if he didn't. Sometimes, though, we follow God. Our, our life changes. It's different. And that's okay. It may be not what we started out being. You know, one time I was talking to one of my sons, and I won't mention his name because I'll owe him $10. <laughs> but uh, he said, did you know what you wanted to be when you were... My age. And I said, yes, I did. I knew exactly what I wanted to be. He said, man, Dad, you're lucky. And I'm like, look at what I'm doing now. <laughs> I'm not doing now what I would, wanted to do then. I knew what I wanted to be, but God took my life on a different path. And it's been pretty cool. It's been wild. It's been amazing. It's been hair-raising. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob limped the rest of his life. Maybe you're afraid of being one of those Jesus freaks, huh? Everybody at work giggles when you walk by. But you know when, the, when their chips are down, guess who door, whose door they're going to come knocking on? Because they know you got answers, right? So take the plunge before God picks a fight with you, right? Take the plunge. Go deeper. Maybe you're like my grandson whose worldview just got shattered. Something happened in your life, and you're like, wow, I don't know how to... I don't know how to unpack this. Well, maybe you had some wrong thinking. And maybe God just wanted to get your attention. Whatever the case may be, whatever you're going to do, go to God. Go to God and trust him. You may not, he may not give you the answer, but you know something? He didn't give Job the answer either, did he? You know, Job had all these complaints, and God never really answered him about his complaint. But what God answered him was about God, you know? So God gave Job what Job really needed was a fresh revelation of who God is. And maybe that's what you're going through right now. You just need a fresh revelation of God, and you need to just stop messing around, stop ro riding on the fence or whatever, whatever you've been doing. You get splinters when you ride on the fence, right? <laughs> and just enter more fully into God. And maybe... You're not a believer in Jesus Christ. Maybe, you know, you consider yourself an atheist or agnostic or maybe just angry. I mean, God really ticks me off, you know. He just didn't do what I thought he would do. And maybe you're looking for some kind of sign, some kind of indication that God is real. Dude, you're here now, right? You probably came expecting a nice Christmas message. What more of a sign do you need? It's not like I invented you, right? Or I invited you, right? You're here now. You heard this message. What are you going to do with it? 
You going to blow it off? It's up to you. Don't leave here today. Don't leave here now until you've done business with God. All right? If you want to come forward and pray, uh, we, we got those ABCs. Why don't you put them up? Because I always, I always go, I, I always tell them differently. <laughs> ABCs. First, admit that I've sinned. You, you want to you, you get on God's, you want God in your life, you want to receive what Jesus has done for you on the cross, first step is admit you're a sinner, that you need him. Second of all, believe that Jesus died for you. Not just that he died for everybody, but he died for you. Personalize it. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of your sin and has given the promise of eternal life through his resurrection. Believe. And the third thing is C, choose. Choose to follow Jesus. To uh, quote Anne of Green Gables, God does not want you as a fair-weathered friend. All right? You, wanna, you need to follow him. You need to surrender your life to him. It's a scary thing when you do that, isn't it? Scary thing. But I'll tell you something. 30 years, it's been a blast. It's been a wonderful life. And I'm not, I'm not checking out anytime soon, by the way, okay? If I say it's been a wonderful life, you think I'm going to die on the way home. Uh-uh. All right? I figure I got another 30 good years left of serving God. I can't wait to see what he's going to show me in those 30 years. Oh, my goodness. But anyway, um, Romans 10, verses 9 through 10. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. I always tell people this. Pray to receive Christ, then go tell somebody, anybody, what you just did. Anybody, a stranger. Just go up to them and say, I just prayed to receive Christ. (laughs) Good for you. Tell somebody. Confess with your mouth what you did. All right, so uh, we're going to close. Stand with me, if you will. Um, If anybody needs prayer, maybe you're not sure if you seated it in your heart, please come forward. We'll pray for you. Uh, Otherwise, you can be dismissed. Um, Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you that you take a special interest in us and that you want us to be your people. And you've given us the, the choice to receive you or not, Lord. So I just pray for anybody here that's wavering that they would Uh, take that step and receive you as their Lord and Savior. For those that maybe have uh, received something that's, you know, shattered their life in some way, Lord, I just pray that they would fall on you and uh, just, just, just accept whatever has happened and, and just want to continue in on, on you and not depart from you. And Lord, I just pray for those of us who are just content in our relationship with you, Lord, I just pray that Every one of us here would want to go deeper in with you. And we just pray this in Jesus' name.